Journaling can often be seen as a habit that wastes time. You're sitting there writing when you could be doing something. But I find setting your intention and setting your desire for the day is a much more powerful and practical way to now walk into your day and feel like you know why you're there, to feel a sense of purpose. And so for me, setting an intention before a big meeting, before a difficult phone call, before an awkward conversation, reminds me of who I want to be in that interaction. And that remembrance, that confidence, and clarity around who I want to be allows me to navigate those seemingly difficult, awkward moments that naturally arise throughout the day. So this is a time that I take, and as you can see from my notes, none of these are beautiful, none of these are perfect, none of these are fully aligned. They are scattered, spontaneous, sometimes random thoughts, and I allow myself to doodle, squiggle, whatever it takes, because that allows me to feel that it's free-flowing. Stop trying to make it perfect. Stop trying to make it look amazing. Just make it the way it allows you to feel like you have a window into your mind. And so when I look at these notes, I sometimes think I'm just allowing myself to express what's on my mind right now. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Rule number two, be curious. When I was around 16, maybe 15, I, we used to celebrate Christmas yeah. every year and Christmas is probably my favorite time of year. Yeah. We were talking about it like <laughs> I love uh, listening to Christmas songs and I love Christmas decoration and for me Christmas is presents. It's presents and, and so I grew up in a culture where we celebrated Christmas but Christmas was presents and a family dinner. And because I went to my school in England, we'd celebrate all the religious holidays. So we knew about all the uh, main stories behind every major mm -hmm. world religion. And so I remember celebrating Christmas at home, but thinking, I don't know that much about Jesus. And should I not be connecting with Jesus? Because that's why we even have this day. And so I started going to church in my local area just out of curiosity. I wasn't trying to be a Christian or trying to be a Hindu or trying to be anything. I was just interested and yeah. curious to be like, what is it about Christ that created a day that has lasted thousands of years mm -hmm. that people all over the world celebrate there must be something here. And so I feel like we get so scared because we want clear designations. We want like a clear title of I am this or I am that. And that gives us a sense of safety and security, but really answers come in the curiosity, not in the security. Yeah. Right? What does that identity do to us in a good way or in a negative way? In a good way, it creates a, and this isn't just about religious identity, it's any identity. Just I'm any a identity. Or any identity. Or whatever. Yeah, it's not about Holding religion. on to this identity of yourself. Yeah. So in the good sense, it surrounds you with more people like that. So if I'm a podcaster, I hang out with more podcasters, we learn more about podcasting, and that's a great thing because we all become better podcasters. The mistake is I go, oh, I can only be a podcaster, but I can't write a book. I can't make a video. I can't do that now. And that's the mistake that it mm. makes. So it should be evolving these titles that we give ourselves, these communities should help us evolve, not devolve, yeah. and, and not stop us from expanding and growing. Okay. And, and so you wanna be around people that are always curious and insightful. Rule number three, build deeper connections. I first learned about this through Dan O'Reilly and his Irrational Labs, where at an event, they encouraged us to ask more vulnerable, deep, and bigger questions. How many of you are tired of small talk? How many of you start every meeting in the same way? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it was good, yeah, you know, same old weekend, yeah, you know, it's, it's been a lot, all right, let's get to work. We literally have the same conversation on repeat almost seven times a day in every meeting. And guess what? Neither you nor the other person enjoys that conversation. Now, this point also applies whether you're working on Zoom or whether you're meeting in person again with people. We're so used to asking someone, how are you? 
And it's kind of a throwaway question. People usually come back and give us one of these five answers. Good, bad, okay, fine, or hmm. We don't learn anything about the other person. We don't get an opportunity to deepen our relationship. And it's almost like we didn't even care when we asked the question. But what if we ask someone, hey, what's a challenge that you've been working through lately? How could I help you through it? Or what's something that you're trying to overcome that you may need an insight on? This type of question gives the person an opportunity to really share what's happening. That vulnerability allows you to build a deeper bond and deeper connection. And now you're actually engaging with someone in a refreshing way. Now, if you're like me and you're still spending a ton of your time on Zoom, I mean, I'm recording podcasts and interviews with some of my favorite authors. We recently had Oprah on the podcast about her new book, What Happened to You? And when I'm speaking to people on Zoom, I found that it's even more difficult to build rapport or a connection, especially if you've never met them before in person. One of the ways I've been able to cross this bridge is by being curious, but not creepy. Now, what I mean by that is about asking someone about something that's in their background. I think by now everyone knows their Zoom shot and their Zoom location. They have a few things in the background, maybe a piece of art and maybe a picture of their family. And this is such a beautiful conversation starter, especially if you're trying to build a new relationship. Recently, I was on a call with a client and I asked him about a really interesting thing that he had hung on his wall behind him. It was a paintbrush. I was so fascinated that I had to be curious, not creepy, and ask him why he had it there. He said, my first ever job when I was around 14 years old is I used to paint fences. And after painting fences, I got to paint rooms. And after painting rooms, I got to start painting homes. And now he's an executive and a director of a large company. And he said that he hangs this paintbrush on his wall to remind him of where he started. Give the person you're speaking to an opportunity to tell you a story. I promise you will be memorable and meaningful. And if not, hopefully it makes one of you laugh. Rule number four, let go. This story was about the journey of a person. And this person came across a tumultuous river. When they saw this river, they knew that if they set foot inside this river, they would get dragged away with the current they realized that they would have to build somewhat of a vehicle or mode of transport to get to the other side. They started to get a log and they thought maybe that was enough and they pushed it out onto the water and whoosh, the water just completely took away the log. They then realized they would have to build something a lot more stable. They got some bamboo, they created two rows, they tied it up with some rope, they even built an oar. They got on top and they started to paddle with all their strength and all their energy. And finally, they made it to the other side. This person thought to themselves, I can never live without this raft. This saved my life. This raft is the reason I'm alive. So they strapped it to their back and decided to take it wherever they went. They started to walk through the forest, but they realized it was difficult to maneuver because the raft just kept getting stuck in between the trees and they'd try and pivot and maneuver and try and navigate through but the raft was just getting chipped and broken and they could either continue to try and struggle through with the raft on their back or they could put the raft down and walk through freely so often what's causing us anxiety is what we're holding on to our views of what is normal what we expect what we want to happen, the picture we're projecting. When you're holding on tightly to something that is slowly being pulled out of your hands, it causes you even more pain and anxiety. What is it that you need to let go of to reduce your anxiety? Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, spot and swap negative thoughts. Thoughts 
are meant to be spotted, stop and reflect, and then swap. And what I mean by that is, if you've got a thought that's repeating, like you said, and is negative, I'm guessing you don't want that thought around for too long. Mm -hmm. So you want to spot when does that thought arrive? Does it arise when I'm with certain people? Does it arise when I'm on a particular social media platform? Does it arise when I go to a particular place? Where is that, what is the seed of that yeah. thought, right? So once I identify that, I now need to stop, spend some time in stillness and go, is this thought benefiting me? Is this thought useful to me? Is this thought actually leading me to who I wanna become? And if it's not, I need to swap it with a thought. So one of my favorite ways of, let's take an example of like, I feel less than, I feel mm -hmm. uh, like I'm not achieving anything. I'm no good. I'm no good, I'm not good enough. So you spot that and you go, oh, I always feel that when I'm going through this particular Instagram profile because I'm looking at someone who I think is better than me. Okay, what do I swap that with? You don't swap that with you're beautiful, you're amazing, you're incredible because you may not believe that yet, yeah. but you, stop it, you, you swap it with, I feel confident when. I feel attractive when, I feel happy and joyful when, and you figure out what is that thing that I need to be and do to feel that emotion. The best place to talk about that though with thoughts is the movie Inception. Mm. So you look at how a thought is planted into someone's mind and how in that movie Leonardo DiCaprio in his wife's mind plants a thought that this is not real. And that thought grows into a belief. A belief that is so strong. It's crazy. Right? And yeah. it's like, that is literally what a thought can do. And you see that in the Joker movie. So I, I did a whole episode last year, which was all about like mental health and the Joker. And you look at the Joker stories, he's trying to bring joy to others, but everyone treats him badly. And so the thought sets in of I'm not worthy, I'm not valuable, my father doesn't want me, no one thinks I'm funny, everyone, uh, makes fun of me, even yeah. when I go on TV, everyone's laughing at me. That idea becomes his reality. Now I get that that's a fiction movie, but the point is still that we see, even in today's world, that thoughts have the ability to become, I, I forget the word that Leonardo DiCaprio uses in the movie, but that thought. Uh, yeah, cancer or some type yeah, of, yeah. it's like a cancer in the mind, right? It like really just expands, and so I think we have to be so good at spotting, stopping, mm -hmm. and swapping thoughts. Rule number six, turn off your notifications. Turn off? your notifications, and turn on chill, relaxing work music. I've done this for such a long time where I have a playlist that I listen to that allows me to just get into the zone. What I find music does, especially instrumental music, that's what I focus on. I try to stay away from popular music that I may listen to in the car or while I'm in the gym. What that does is it gives the mind enough distraction, enough rhythm, enough pattern, enough momentum, so that you can actually focus your mind on the activity at hand. Now some of you may prefer silence or working to chatter and that's fine too, you can even put that type of music on. But for me, instrumental beats and rhythms are a fantastic way of getting into the zone. Turning off your notifications is just a no-brainer if you're really trying to do some deep work. Rule number seven, value family time. When you're with loved ones, when you're with family, when you're with your friends, make a vow to not use technology. If you need to have, I've seen these around where you have a technology jar and everyone puts their phone in it at the start of a dinner and takes it at the end. Make a vow that when you're with your friends, when you're with your family, that you will not be on your phone and leave your phones in the same place, in one area, so that none of you can just get that sneaky moment I have to take a look at it. When you first start, you may be worried that you're gonna be bored of each other. You might even be worried well, how's this person going to compete with my phone? How are they gonna entertain me? I mean, my phone has access to every form of entertainment. Sit in that discomfort again. And in that discomfort, you're gonna learn something new about that person. You're gonna become more curious. Your mind actually has the opportunity to start building a different bond. Earlier I mentioned that you want to create no technology times in your home. You also want to create no technology zones in your home. In mine and Radhi's home, those spaces are the dining table and the bedroom. Those are two areas that we want to be technology free that we've designated as important areas of connection. And so the dining table and the bedroom becomes places and zones in my home where we don't use technology. Rule number eight, define the terms. 
Harvard did a table, which I really believe is what mindful speaking is all about. Mm. So, what is this? So it's called the it's called Harvard List of Emotions, but I I kind of changed the name to Emotional Vocabulary because I think it sounds better. Okay. Uh, so an emotional vocabulary. If you look at all of the world's emotional vocabulary, it's very limited. We use five words to describe pretty much everything: good, <laughs> bad, yeah, okay, fine. Hmm. So it's like, how's your week going? Good. How's your day been? Bad. How are you feeling? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, literally, like we, we use such limited words and that may be okay for the majority of people, but in your personal relationships, it's so important to expand your emotional vocabulary. Mm. So this table that Harvard has made, which anyone can find just by typing in Harvard list of emotions on Google, what that does is that it shows you that when you say you're sad, what do you actually mean? So it gives you all this list of emotions that sit under the word sad. Are you irritated? Mm. Are you offended? Are you disappointed? Have you been let down? The more you expand your emotional vocabulary, the more you can diagnose how you feel. Interesting. And the more you can tell your partner or your friend. This is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm <laughs> actually feeling. Huh. And, and this is one of the biggest mistakes with words is that we think our words mean the same thing. Now, when you say love, you might think forever. And when I say love, I might think for tonight, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and that is literally how the word love or care or marriage or forever gets misused, abused and thrown about because we both mean different things. And our meanings are based on our backgrounds our and beliefs our beliefs but yeah. how we were born and yeah. how our, our parents our culture our experience everything yeah it, it forms our meaning so i really believe that in a relationship in our communication with words define words mm. when you say yeah we're best friends or friends what does that mean to you when we're business partners what does that mean to you a contract in a financial legal sense is to define the terms Right. But in our emotional sense, we also need to define the terms. And we don't do that emotionally enough. And that's why we feel emotionally like someone broke the contract. Mm. And you have nothing to hold them to because you never made a contract. You never, commu you never communicated. You never communicated. The it. meaning of these words. Exactly. And that's why words are so powerful, but they're only powerful when we agree on the definition. Rule number nine, stop procrastinating. If you're someone who finds that you're always procrastinating, you're always overanalyzing, overthinking, and you're struggling to get stuff done, this video is for you. The first step is identifying why we procrastinate. How many of you have ever wondered, why do I overthink? I want to get this done. I want to make progress in my life. But for some reason, I just can't seem to stop. Alexander Rosenthal, who's a procrastination researcher, explains the four types of trigger. We procrastinate because of expectancy, value, time, or impulsivity. People procrastinate because of a lack of value associated with the task, or because they expect that they're not going to achieve the value they're trying to achieve, or because the value is too far from you in terms of time, and finally, because you're very impulsive as a person. What's interesting about understanding where your procrastination comes from is that it allows you to understand what the challenge is and what the issue is without blaming yourself, without thinking that something is wrong with you. And actually, the clearer you get about the value you're going to get from the task, the amount of time you do have to dedicate to it, don't judge yourself. So many of us, when we procrastinate and overthink, start to feel that there's something wrong with us. We judge ourselves, we make ourselves feel guilty, we say negative things about ourselves to ourselves and to others. We start saying things like, I'm so lazy, I'm so worthless, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. This doesn't make you more productive, more proactive, or more effective. How many times has putting yourself down made you lift yourself up? I don't think those two things go together. What ends up happening is that when we judge ourselves for being procrastinators, we create a prison of guilt. This becomes a space that we actually can't break out of, and it's how procrastination keeps us trapped by making us believe that we can't do anything, that we're no better. So we need to stop judging ourselves. How do we stop judging ourselves? By letting go realizing that we all make mistakes and that we're gonna leave that all behind 
and we're going to turn over a fresh page that we're going to start anew. Annual number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is have fun. You can go first. I want to watch what happens. So now we're doing Now it all gets real. How much is fastened? How much? Where am I? Now where am I fastened? Yeah, I'm good, man. Huh? Where am I attached to? Now I feel like that's the only thing yeah, that's man. attaching us to the zip line. Just that one hook. Don't, don't, don't think about it. Don't okay. think about it. My hands. Oh all my right. god! It all gets real now. You're literally only hooked to one thing. I don't. Where am I meant to? Uh, how far body, should I be? Am I doing this right? Okay, no, there's two hooks. That's good. What do you think? I think you should have gone first because you're looking at it. Okay, legs I know, belly, I know. Belly. Okay. I feel like I need the toilet. Yeah, yep. Like okay. Oh, God. Cool. Yes. I don't think I'm going to be able to When are you going to let me off? Yeah. I'm not okay. sure I want to do this, actually. Are you sure? Do you want to want to do it? I don't know. Bob, if you don't want to do it, I don't want you to do it. Is it? No, it's fine. No, if you don't feel comfortable, Bob. No, I'm fine. Are you sure? Oh, I don't know. I'm fine. <laughs> Buddy, you're all the way up. <laughs> Do you singing? Yeah. <laughs> now they get stuck. Oh, are you just gonna push me? How is this working? Just meditate, oh, Rad. Are you sure I'm fastened properly? Raddy, keep your legs straight and hold your harness, yeah? Okay. Once you're past this building, you can open your arms. I up. don't want to. I'm not opening my this eyes. This view is beautiful. Spectacular. I'm okay. <laughs> oh you... no, where am I going? When do we go? Okay, Raddy, you're ah! done. Give us a countdown. Give me a countdown. Can we count them down, guys? <laughs> Can we count no, them down? I'm not. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah. Who's catching me the other end? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, but I'm not opening my eyes. It's just everywhere. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, the science says you have a 35% chance of actually following through on your goals. That, that's not good enough, no. Not for you, Believe Nation, we gotta do something. But when you write it down and you create a specific plan of action for the next week, that number jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment on this video, it jumps to 95%. You need to follow through on your goals. So what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your specific plan of action for the next week? Put it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. Now, how many times have you ever woke up in the morning and had that conversation in your head? There's one voice that says, go back to sleep. You've had a really tough week. You've been working so hard. And there's another voice that says, this is gonna be the start of a great week. You've had enough rest, now's the time to get up and you're gonna perform at the highest level. This is a conversation between the mind and the intelligence. The mind is the monkey mind, the intelligence is the monk mind. The monkey mind just wants to sleep, be lazy, lethargic and not focus on getting proper rest. You probably were forced by that monkey mind to stay up the night before and watch a show till 2 a.m. anyway. The monk mind wants you to have a proactive start to the day, proactive start to the week. So here's what's happening. We have five senses, sight, smell, touch, 
taste and hearing. Now, all of these have different triggers. So if we think about food, you see good food, right? Or let's say you see junk food, you smell that junk food, you know what that junk food tastes like. You don't hear junk food, I don't think anyway. And as soon as that happens, there's a response that goes straight to your mind. Now what happens in your mind, and as you can see, this is a very accurate drawing of what your mind really looks like inside. But this area of your mind, it reminds you of your past experiences you've had. So when you see those fries, you smell those fries, you see those fries, you touch those fries, it sends a response to your mind. Your mind knows what those fries taste like. It remembers the last time you had them and how good they felt and straight away goes, yeah, let's have them. And so the mind goes, sure, let's go and plan and create. And now we have those. Now we start to eat that. And that is a recurring habit and cycle in our life. It happens from everything from food that's bad for us to toxic relationships through to making bad career decisions. The simple act of reminding ourselves of a positive experience with someone or something allows us to continue that repetition. The way we strengthen the monk mind and the God inside our minds so that we don't just give in to the temptations and the urges of the mind is through the four R's format. So these four R's have to be done in order and when they're executed effectively, you will know that your God and your monk mind is getting stronger. The first R is reason. You need a really powerful reason for why you're making this new change in your life. If you don't have a deep, profound reason in your life, it will be really, really difficult. I'll give you an example. If someone says that they want to quit drinking alcohol just because they want to do it, it's different from someone saying, I want to quit drinking alcohol because I want to save my family. I want to keep my family together and this habit is ruining our interactions and so I really want to kick this habit. It. Notice the difference in reason, right? Even if we want to learn something, it's like, oh, I want to learn to play an instrument. Why? Oh, just because I feel like it. Or I want to learn to play an instrument because I want to propose by playing the piano. Notice the depth of reason. Reason is the first R that's needed to strengthen the God. And it's almost like the God building its foundation. So the monk mind is based on creating a strong sense of reason. Now, what I want you to do is choose that one thing you're trying to change in your life right now. And I want you to ask yourself, what's your real reason for wanting to change it? What is your deep reason for wanting to change it? Now, our reasons can also be negative or positive. A negative reason can be revenge, or a negative reason can be getting our own back or showing people Right? It's kind of like that look at me now kind of feeling. And we know that in the long term that won't satisfy us because again we're seeking validation from someone feeling differently about us. But our reason being for people that we love, our reason being for ourselves, our reason being a really heartfelt, deep internal belief that if we don't change this, it's not going to be good for us or the people we love. And so the first R is having a really strong reason. So I'm just gonna write that down. So reason, bring a check next to reason. The second R that we need in our life is research. Your reason is given more ammunition and depth through good research. What I mean by that is you may pick up the phone to a coach. You may speak to someone who's already mastered that habit. You may focus on reading about books and watching documentaries and listening to podcasts about that subject. The more you absorb information, the more likely you are to create transformation. Remember that. The more you absorb information, the more you're likely to create transformation because now you have so much research that is consistently convincing the God to help convince the senses. Every time you want something or see something or chase something, the God can say, but do you remember when we read that study? Do you remember when we watched that documentary? Do you remember when you spoke to that coach? And all of a sudden you have so much more reasoning power when you research. So the second step is research and the best way are books, podcasts and people, right? Books, podcasts and people are the best forms of research. When you want to create a habit change in your life, make sure that what you listen to, what you read and what you speak about is about the subject you're trying to grow in. When you immerse yourself in that way, you will see maximum impact in your life. So the second R is research. The third R is repetition. 
repetition. If we don't consistently make this a priority in our life, it's just not going to happen. We have to repeat that action. So we have to prioritize around it. And this is something I say often, right? If you really want to make something a priority in your life, it has to be a small step and a big priority. Often what we try and do is we try and change every area of our life and then naturally nothing changes. But the better thing to do is choose one area and make it your top priority. So if you wanna start going to the gym, make that the one big thing you're going to achieve that day and set a time that you can actually make it. Don't set it at an awkward time. I know someone who literally used to struggle working out. So instead of that, what she would do is when she would roll off the bed, she would have her yoga mat and all of her gym equipment laid out right near her bed so she had no excuse, right? It was the first thing she saw in the morning and so she could naturally naturally start exercising straight away. That also is true for not triggering the senses, right? Repetition also includes, if you're trying to stay off sugar, if you just don't have any sugar items in your closet or in your cupboard or in the fridge, then there's no chance that you're going to have it. So you can actually save yourself by removing it from the trigger of the senses. So that is repetition. The fourth R is responsibility right? You want to be able to do this with someone. You want to feel like you're growing with someone. That's why having a tribe or a community or a group of people that are trying to aim for the same thing means you're more likely to get there. You know, if you're trying to start a new habit like cycling more, if you're cycling with a group of people, now guess what? You're not just relying on your motivation, you're relying on 10 other people to motivate you as well. If you're going to the gym with a friend, responsibility and accountability makes you more likely to get to your destination. I feel like we give, we give our toxic relationships and negativity so much energy. We're like, like for example, in your comment section on Instagram for anyone who's on social <laughs> media, for everyone who's on social media, you could pinpoint the one negative comment out of a hundred positive comments. And we all do it, we amplify the negative and you see it all the time. And we do the same in our lives where we sit here talking about all the toxicity. And so for me, it's like, I can either spend all my energy trying to convince that one person to love me, or I can reply to the people that love me already and they'll love me more because they are already engaged with me and they're gonna feel so happy that I responded to them. And I think this is a, a great simple tip for everyone who's listening is just when you respond to positivity in your life, it just increases. When you respond to the negativity in your life, it just increases. And so trying to get someone to like you and defend yourself and control how they feel about you, it wastes and drains so much energy. And you could use all that energy for the people that love you. When we were put out on the streets with nothing, nothing but had to fend for ourselves and you recognize how you can actually live with very little, and how you need very little to get by. Whether it was fasting, like not being able to eat for several days or drink for several days, you recognize how grateful you are for what you do have. And so these mini experiments that are very extreme, that I'm not saying anyone has to do, or I'm right. not recommending right. anyone at home to do them. All I'm trying to say is that the body is like a vehicle, we have to take care of it. Just as you have a nice car, you gotta take care of that nice car. But if you don't feed the driver, that car's not going anywhere. And so many of us have become more addicted to the vehicle than we have to the driver inside. And so the way of tapping into that driver inside is spend time with people who know their driver really well. And that's why monks were such a big part of my growth, because you meet people who have no agenda, want nothing from you, want nothing of the world, and are not trying to get somewhere. Like there's no, there's no win-win, it's only win for you. <laughs> like there's no win in it for them. And, and being around the energy of realized people who have that realization, who've been with their consciousness for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That's a huge part of it. We're being built for a job, or we're being built to be in a box. Right. We're being built so that we fit into society. And I find it funny, right? It's like, when you're a kid, you're told to fit in. Like, what, you probably remember this, stay in line, yeah. like fit in, yeah. everyone has to wear a uniform, everyone dresses the same, everyone has to do this. And then, when you grow older, what are we all trying to do? We're all trying to stand out. It's weird. It's like your whole life you were told to fit in, and then as soon as you grow older, it's like, oh, you need a personal brand now, you need to stand out. Like, do you know your own voice? You need to stand out. How do you deal with it when the doubt is coming from the people that you really love and you know they care about you? Yeah, it was hard. I didn't go to my, gradu I graduated, but never went to my graduation ceremony. So my mom doesn't have a picture of me holding my degree, and that was a big thing for her, yeah. because I moved to India, I just went. 
So I never went to that and that was a big thing for her. And actually my parents, I'm very grateful. My mom and dad are actually fairly liberal and supportive of anything I've decided to do. It's my extended family that's had more opinions yeah. and been more involved in kind of stirring stuff up with my parents, if that makes sense. So the way I dealt with it was always asking myself these questions around, you know, is someone invested in my future? Is someone gonna be there for me when I'm struggling? And is someone paying my bills? Like those are my three checking system of who matters in life. Like your soul, your mind, and your paycheck. And I think the biggest thing I asked myself was just, am I gonna look back, on, if I don't do this, am I gonna look back, going back to the Alexander the Great story, am I gonna look back on my deathbed and say, my mom and dad held me back? Because I may say I'm gonna do it for them, I'm not gonna do this decision because I respect them and love them, but am I gonna hate them in the end or be bitter towards them or feel a negative feeling towards them because I feel they held me back? And if that's the truth, I never wanna feel that about my parents, they're incredible. So I need to go and take the responsibility to make this shift. And I think the truth is that when we think people are holding us back, it's just us not taking responsibility for us to push forward. Like that's all it is. Because the truth is if you really, 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 really want something, right? Like if someone told you right now, you had to get on a plane and there's a million dollars in New York, no one would say, oh, my parents can't afford a plane. Like no one would say that, you would, no. you would do it. If you really wanted it, you'd get on a plane right now and you'd go pick that million dollars up. So it's our own insecurity that we reflect onto the people around us. And I think it's really important. I, I get it, there are people who are toxic around us. I get it, I had that too. There were people who were just like, literally people said to me like, you realize you're gonna fail at being a monk. You realize when you come back, no one's gonna hire you. You realize when you come back, no one's gonna wanna be with you. You realize, you know, there were so many things like people like, you know you're gonna be socially dead. Like no one's gonna care where you are. There was so much of that but it didn't get amplified because I was strong in my conviction. So the way I dealt with it was just keep strengthening your conviction rather than trying to weaken the argument. Because the, the, the opinions of others will get weakened when you strengthen your own, right? That's how it works. You don't weaken someone else's to strengthen your own. We're so used to in our life having instant judgment, defining a moment and giving it a label, good or bad, in the moment. And I thought, how do I present a concept to the world where we can laugh at ourselves and realize that sometimes our instant judgment or our instant labeling processor isn't always correct? Yes. How do we, how do we get that? So this script or narrative that I shared in this video is around a gentleman who goes to buy these cookies because he feels like having a few cookies because his flight's delayed and he sits down to eat these cookies and the gentleman opposite him where you're sitting right now starts to take cookies out as well and he's thinking how's this guy and the guy looks a little rugged he looks a little scruffy he doesn't look put together so naturally all of our biases our unconscious biases start coming up and stemming up and we start thinking oh he looks a little shady or maybe he doesn't have money that's why he's taking my cookies and we have this impression of I, me and mine these are my cookies how can he take them only to realize when he leaves that your cookie box was in your bag and that gentleman was sharing his cookies with you. And then this person has this epiphany or this moment of realizing how quick he was to judge, but how wrong he was. And I think all of us in different ways have different moments in our life where whether we misjudged a person the first time we met them, or we misjudged someone because of the first thing they said to us, or we had a friend that now is our best friend, but our first impression was, oh, they're a loser. And all of a sudden now we think they're amazing. Emotional intelligence to me is being able to be aware of yourself, self-awareness, being able to know yourself. That's the highest form of EQ. Right. Like being able to say, I know when I'm at my best, I know when I struggle, and I know when this is a limiting belief or not. And then being able to process all of that. So we're not helping people, we are, I, I love saying this because it, it simplifies it, but we teach people what to think, not how to think. Right. We tell them two plus two is four, but we don't tell them how to think about a problem. And that's why when you're faced with a new problem and you don't have a formula for it and you don't have an equation for it, right. you're like, oh, I'm stuck, right? And, and life's like that. Like when in life have you used a formula to solve a real situation oh, in life, even it. business? Yeah. Like when has a formula helped you? Yeah. But we're taught that formulas solve equations. But we all know that there's no formula to business, success, happiness, meaning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I literally <clears throat> skip over negative comments. Genuinely, since day one, and I remember reading them at the start, and so I'll, I'll add this. There have been times when I've looked at negative comments, 
and they're like, oh, that's quite funny. Like, you know, it's oh, yeah. funny, they're true. But overall, I try to respond to everyone who said something positive, and I rarely put any energy into put anyone who put anything negative because I don't want to change their mind. They're entitled to their belief. They're okay to feel that way. And if I feel like it's good feedback, I'll take it on board. But if I feel like it's just someone being a keyboard warrior and you know doesn't like me and saying what they want, then I'm not going to take that seriously. Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the two. 100%. If there's some authenticity and truth behind it, it's a much different comment than just unabashed hate. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had everything from he has a wind machine in his videos to make sure his <laughs> hair flies, right? Like I've had that that angle. And I'm but like, you don't have I a wind don't. machine? I don't. I just went out on a really windy day. <laughs> this is My an exclusive is, on the yeah, podcast. This is an exclusive <laughs> on the podcast. I do not have a wind machine. Uh, but I've had everything from that and I laughed at that. I thought that was a hilarious comment. Through to the other side of just like, you know, I don't agree with you and I don't agree with the point you're making. This is my point. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I had three minutes to explain that and I missed that point. Like, you're right. You know, I agree with you. If I, if I had a podcast like this, I could have explained myself. So, you know, I, but I do think that we do drag our own selves down. We put all the energy into the negativity and amplify it. Another story I'll tell you because I love this too and it shows so, and, and he'll like this story. So Marcus Aurelius, if you haven't read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, highly recommend it. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor, Meditations is his personal journal. And one of the stories that I love about him that, that comes up in a few Hollywood movies too, is that once when he was walk, walking through the Roman town square, he used to have his advisor follow him around. And whenever people would glorify him and praise him, the person's job was to come into his ear and whisper, you're just a man, you're just a man. Just to oh, remind wow. him, just to remind him in that moment where you just, you know, in that moment where you just feel like your ego is just going through the roof because everyone's saying, you're amazing, you changed my life, etc." A, to remember you're just a man, and I would add to that, remember the people who made you that, right? Wow. Remember the people who gave you that. And so that's how I've learned to balance ego is by any time I'm glorified or praised or appreciated or recognized, I'm passing that off to my teachers, guides, mentors, the universe, and accepting it on their behalf. So if I receive an award, I actually don't think it's mine. I'm accepting it on behalf of everyone who made me the way I am. It's beautiful. Whether it was positive or negative too. One of my favorite thoughts from Martin Luther King is, if you want a new idea, read an old book. What old books? <laughs> uh, many different ones. The Bhagavad Gita is probably one of my favorite books. It's, it's been such a huge part of my personal journey and personal life. Uh, many other religious texts as well. So the Bible has been a big part of my study. Spent a lot of time with the Bible. And, and then it can just be thoughts and ideas, even of the last 2,000 years. So Stoicism, a huge fan of Marcus Aurelius Meditations. That's been a huge book for me that I've studied. And sometimes old can just mean 50 years or 100 years ago too. Mm. But those are some of the bigger ideas that I think have had more prominent effects in my life. So Vedic and Stoic knowledge has probably been the most influential. After a long time, the other day, my friends and I went bowling. And I started to think to myself that life is a lot like bowling. Bowling is a team sport just like life. In bowling, sometimes the best players struggle and others that were less likely to do well surprise you and make all the difference. This is one of my favorite lessons. Focusing on someone else's score doesn't make yours any better. It's easy to get distracted by how well someone else is playing. You see their score go up, they bowl a strike or a spare, and you're calculating in your mind what you think that could be. But all that does is it distracts you from your game. Similarly, in life, focusing on someone else's Instagram grid doesn't make yours any better. Focusing on what someone else is doing for work or what they're driving doesn't make yours any better. Focus on yourself, focus on your own role, your strengths, that will make all the difference. I'm able to not judge myself because I don't judge others. A lot of people who powerful. are like, a lot of, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me, I don't know, I'm so just- so powerful. No, I love about, that, that's okay. such a great point. How do you think That's about such that a shit? great point. No, you're, you're spot on because the reason why we have 
we judge others is because we judge ourselves, right? The opposite of what you're saying. And so for me, it's the same thing. The reason why I don't expect is because I see everything as my responsibility. Yep. I see everything as my work. Yes. And I see everything else as a bonus. Yes. Like it's just amazing that anyone even cares about me or has time for me or makes an effort to do something or connect me to someone, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And that's just a beautiful bonus of life. But I've got to be in charge of it. And I think that just came from many years of having expectations. I think that came from times when I did expect and I didn't get, and I realized I don't want to feel this way anymore. I always talk about there's two types of create, well, there's three types of creators, but we usually end up one or the two. So there's the sellout creator. A sellout creator only goes with what the audience wants. So you literally forget about anything you care about or believe in, you just go for what you think is going to get likes. And then the opposite is the selfish creator who only creates for themselves. They're like, I think this is amazing. Like <laughs> I'm the funniest person in the world or I'm the deepest person or whatever it is. And you create something and like no one wants to watch it because you literally made it for you and your mom. Like, you know, it's kind of like sits there. And so I always aim for being in the middle. I recognize that I want to stand for what I believe in, but I also want it to connect and resonate and have a positive impact on other people's lives. So that's my starting point point that every piece of content should be true to me but it should resonate with people it should make a difference I set a goal very early on that my videos were only 75% complete and I say this everywhere actually I've never said it often on, I've never said it on a podcast but I've said it often in, on stage and at events my videos are only 75% complete which means I mess words up often. So you'll see that sometimes my sentence wasn't perfect. I mispronounced a word. I developed a lisp on a word because it was in flow and I said it and it wasn't right, but it felt right. And other things where I finished a shoot and we forgot a shot that was huge for the video, but I'm like, it's all right, 75%. So my goal with every video is 75%. And I've had to do that because I've realized that if I wait for 75 to 99, I'll be waiting for a year oh. and a half or three years. Like two videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have two videos, right? And we release three videos a week right now. And so for me, the goal was always 75%. And I personally I love think, that. Yeah, and I personally think that's a great aim because 75% yeah. is realistic, it's quality. So you're not settling for less, but 75 to 99 is such a long journey. I think the first thing is you've got to get comfortable being you. See, no one will ever be comfortable with you being you if you're not comfortable being you. And I think we first try and prove ourselves to other people. So my favorite, this is like, I talk about this all the time. It's, it's probably one of my favorite pieces of insights. It's from a writer named Cooley in the 1900s. And he said, today I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So what he means by that is, we are living in a perception of a perception of ourself. If I think you guys think that I'm nice, then I feel nice. If I think that you think I'm weird, I feel weird. So we're constantly living through the perception of a perception of someone else. So my first thing is get away from that. Take that away, figure out how you feel about yourself. So I would say happiness is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself, right? Like how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself, when no one else is around? We've all heard the story, and I'm just sharing it again to give context. We've all heard the story of the two wolves or the two dogs, however you want to phrase it. And if you haven't, I'll, I'll tell it now. It's, it's a story of how inside of us there are two dogs, two wolves, and they're fighting for supremacy. So inside you, one is the initiator and one is the responder. Your whole life, you've been feeding and listening to the initiator. So your initiating wolf is strong, powerful, bulky, aggressive, because it's been fed well your whole life. And your responsive dog, your responsive wolf, has not been fed, has not been listened to. And so it's weak and feeble and meek and, and humble and doesn't even stand to fight. So when they two come to fight inside of you, this, this wolf's just gonna eat that wolf right up. And that's what's happening right now. So for all of us, whatever two wolves you're seeing, whether it's your mind and your intelligence, whether it's your intuition versus what your parents say, whether it's expectations of society versus your expectations of yourself, like whatever two wolves you have inside of you, the one that wins is the one you feed and the ones you have been feeding. Now, if you're at a point where you are and, and where I am and where all of us are in different scenarios of our life, where we're trying to shift and start feeding the other one, it's hard because the other one's just been fed more, it's stronger, it's able to push you, mm. it's able to dictate you. And this is where detachment's so key that detachment doesn't mean that you own nothing. Detachment means that nothing owns you. And most of us have become owned by our darker wolves. Most of us have become owned yeah. by the self that we don't want. 
So, so that conditioning has been drawn up. The only way to break it is to disrupt the pattern, to really break that. It has to be, and this is why I talk to people about immersive experiences. Like you meditating for 10 minutes a day on a headspace, that's wonderful and I recommend it, yeah. but that's not gonna shift this in a drastic way. Right. You are going to have to go and spend a week out in Joshua Tree with the shaman. You are going to have to take a break Jerusalem. In, in Jerusalem, <laughs> right? We were both in love with Jerusalem. Like instead of going on a holiday this year, you are gonna have to go on a three day intensive transformative retreat. And the reason why I'm saying all these different things is they all have different budgets. They're all available in different countries. You don't have to go to India and live with monks, right. but you have to do something and it has to be immersive. Because when you get immersed in something, then you're giving something the power to break your pattern. Right. And I think the challenge is we're trying to solve it by a little thing every day, which is a good start to get us going. But if you're really serious about a massive shift in your life, wherever you're seeing that energy coming from for the right side, the responsive side, yeah. you need to go water that, you need to go feed it, you yeah. need to, and you need to go give it energy. And that's what I think we find that and then that's where I think people struggle. They still want to go on their beach holiday. They, they're like, no, I can't give that up. I need that. Or this weekend, I still need to go and do up my house. And it's like, well, no, like, just imagine what would happen if this weekend you just went on a three day retreat that changed your life. Like, yeah. imagine if you just gave that energy. In terms of finding your purpose, that seems like it's the first step, is getting comfortable with yourself, understanding that. How do we take that next step towards finding that purpose? Yeah, so for me, I, I define it as your passion is for you, your purpose is for others. So your purpose is when you use your passion to serve others. That's the, the, the link. So for me, the focus actually first becomes what's your passion? Like, what are you passionate about? What do you enjoy doing? And then the, miss, the parts that, that's usually missed, so everyone here is follow your passion, find your passion. It's like a cliche, it's everywhere. The difference is get really good at it. Like get so good at it. And everyone always misses that point. You can be as passionate as you want about tennis. But if you're not really good at tennis, no one's gonna care and no one's gonna take note. And I think that's often missed that not only do you need to find what you're passionate about, you need to turn it into an expertise which is undeniable. And that requires the hard work, that requires the work ethic, that requires the early mornings, that requires the training in whatever field you wanna be. And then, and that's gonna make you successful. So when you figure out your passion and you get really good at it, you're gonna become successful but you're only gonna be happy when you use that success to help other people. And then you've gotta figure out that link to purpose. So you're gonna find your purpose. So when you realize, hey, I'm really good at this, I love it, I get a lot of happiness from doing it, when you start using that to make a difference in other people's lives in any way, it automatically switches into a purpose. So you don't need to find your purpose, it's just an automatic evolution of finding your passion and being really good at it. And that's where we're messing up, that we haven't found something we love, and we haven't found something that we love that we've got really good at. So what we usually do with our lives is we do things that we're not good at and don't love, right? Or we do things that we're good at but don't love. And we need to switch into the spaces of things that we love but are not good at and get really good at them and start finding out things that you are good at and you do love. There's different ways to play the game. Some people spin the ball, some people go for a straight, direct roll, some people use two or three fingers, the list continues. And the truth is, it's exactly the same in our lives. You will see some people succeeding in a certain way and others doing it completely differently. The goal is to find your way, your method, your approach, the direction that works for you without trying to copy or mimic or imitate someone else. And we've all experienced this. Sometimes your ball ends up in the gutter. I'm sure you've had that before. Sometimes your throw was completely out of control and your ball went directly into the gutter. Or maybe sometimes you actually felt well prepared and confident, but the ball still ended up in the gutter. In life, just like that ball, sometimes we feel we're in the gutter, but there's something to learn from that. And just like the ball comes back, when we learn through our experience, we get another opportunity to improve, another opportunity to try, another opportunity to succeed. As Oscar Wilde said, all of us are in the gutter, but some of us are looking up at the stars. Sometimes you hit a spare. You threw your best shot, you got the angle perfectly right, you prepared with everything you had, and that one pin 
is still up there. Sometimes, despite our best efforts in life, we don't get what we want. Not everything aligns. Everything doesn't go to plan. Life is a lot like bowling. Keep your eyes on the ball, your concentration in the game, and your mind out of the gutter. And in the end, we realize we have to be just like that bowling pin. No matter how hard we're hit by life, no matter how hard we're hit by others, we have to keep stepping back up. That has happened so many times when a video you think's gonna hit and it doesn't, and then there's a video you're like, that's never gonna hit, and it does. And that's where I've reconciled myself doubt, is recognizing that I don't always know what's gonna work, and that's a beautiful thing. And that I've been, and, I, and I've been feeling this often, that I've got to where I want in life, just not in the way I imagined it. And that's the beauty of giving up that control and feeling slightly liberated. So I'll give an example of what I mean by that. I'm always working strategically, effectively, and impactfully in the best ways I can. But sometimes the place where I put my most energy does the worst, and sometimes something that I tried on the side like blows up, and it's incredible. And that's where I've reconciled myself down, recognizing if I'm putting my best foot forward and I'm working strategically and effectively, the things that are going to work will work. And it may not be the things I expect. And what we're doing is, or what I do sometimes too, is you're so focused on wanting one thing to work, you miss the fact that there's like nine other things that are happening that are amazing around you that you could never have dreamed of. And I've seen that in my life countless times where I wanted one thing to work, <laughs> three things were working over here, but I was so like, why is this not working? Like, why is this not working? That you miss that. So self-doubt for me is something that I've tried to build a close relationship with. And I get it all the time. I still get it before a post, before a video, before anything. I mean, I was just in, you know, I'm working on my book right now. I just launched a podcast. And before I launched the podcast, I had no idea how well it was gonna do, how badly it was gonna do, or anything. And there was a part of me that was like, are people gonna listen to this? Like, are people gonna care? Like, I ask myself all those questions still today. Number one, I'm glad I asked myself those questions. It means I'm human. It means that I care. It means that it's important to me. I speak at so many conferences and everyone always asks me, do you still get nervous? I go, yes, I get nervous because I care. The day I stop feeling nervous, that means I don't care anymore. If I don't care anymore, that means I don't love what I do anymore. So for me, the first thing is I recognize that self-doubt just shows me that I care and that something's important to me. Whereas I don't doubt myself around things that I don't care about. Like if you asked me a question right now about what's the recipe for this amazing dish, I wouldn't know and I'd say, I don't know. And I'd be okay with it because I don't care about cooking. I'm not a cook, right? But if it's something that you care about, you'll, you'll have self-doubt. The second thing that I do with self-doubt is I go, okay, if that's the things that I'm doubting myself for, what strategies, what can I put into place to overcome them? Doubt is just a great way of making you check what you need to work on. So if my doubt is, oh my God, not enough people are gonna listen to this. So I'm like, okay, so how do we make it more listenable? How do we make the content better? How do we make the conversation better? If my doubt is, um, you know, I don't feel like people are gonna like this topic. Okay, what themes am I good at talking about? What is, you know, it's, it's a great checking system to improve what you have. So don't look at self-doubt as negative. Turn it into a positive by actually asking yourself those questions, right? So build a relationship with self-doubt because it's never gonna go away. Right, don't no, avoid it. Don't avoid That's it, the worst definitely thing. don't avoid it. It's never gonna go away. So if it's never gonna go away, build a happy, positive relationship with it. So my positive relationship with it is you're showing me what I need to focus on to feel less of that. And most of us feel self-doubt because we're not researching, we're not building knowledge, we're not building expertise. And I think that's the biggest thing for me, is when I feel self-doubt, it's because I do, I'll, I'll give a perfect example. When I was thinking about doing a podcast and you're doing interviews, you don't just become an interviewer. You have to watch interviews. You have to absorb good interviewers. You've, you can't just be an interviewee, you have to watch good interviewees. And so for me, a lot of us start something and we feel self-doubt because we've never learned that skill or we've never observed that skill. So my focus is if I want to be a good interviewer, I need to watch good interviewers. If you want to be a good stage performer, watch good stage performers. If you want to be a good monk, watch good monks, right? You don't become something good without seeing it. So self-doubt comes because you haven't upskilled. 
And the great thing today is you can do an online course. You can upskill from here. You can upskill from there. You can just listen to this podcast and watch you guys who've done it for such a long period of time. That's a, seeing someone who's done something consistently, that's the best way of getting good at something. And then your self-doubt will disappear. So self-doubt can only be cut by the sword of knowledge. It can only be cut by the sword of upskilling. So that's where it starts. Right? Love is a doing word. It's active. It's a verb. And if love is a verb, then service is the action. And that's why love and service have to be so intertwined because I feel that today when we talk about love, the definition is so skewed. When people hear the word love, that's they, maybe what the problem is. That's what the problem is. That's why I prefer service to love because service is the activation of love. When someone loves someone, they serve. That's how love works. And I think that's why when we talk about love, I agree, it's just because of phonetics, definitions, breaking it down, love has become so badly abused. Like the word love is so abused and misused in our lives. Hey, it really is, right? right? You say, I love you to people you don't love, people use it to manipulate people. We just throw love around. Right. And as much as it should be everywhere, it's also sacred. Love's also sacred. And that's why you were able to experience it because it was experienced through a sacred mechanism. You were able to experience love. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I've never felt it like that before because it also was this sense of self-love as well. Yeah, and that's what you felt in Jerusalem too right. when you went, and that's what I felt. And, and that's what I feel that we experience love when it's through service and engagement in that atmosphere. We don't just experience it every single day. I personally also, having become a... I feel like I've become even more of a seeker since being involved. And that's opened me up to alternative ideas, alternative ways of thinking, learning from all different traditions wherever I can. And, and I think that's a really important part. I think the challenge with being a immature seeker in my definition of it is you find something, it sounds cool, and you go, that's it, there's nothing else. Mm. And then a real seeker goes, well, that is it, but how can everything else even enhance this mm. and make this even greater for me if this is where my faith is or this is where my belief system is? So I'm someone who genuinely loves learning from people from all different walks of life and backgrounds because I feel if I was presented with a deeper, more meaningful philosophy and life structure, I would adopt it. Yeah. That's why, because I'm open to that. We were left on the streets for 30 days to fend for ourselves and to figure it out. Just, that's it. You've got your clothes that you're wearing. There's no money, no food, no shelter, no nothing. Figure it out. And day one, I'm like, okay, like, you know, maybe it's a joke. Like, maybe, maybe they're going to come back at night and be like, no, guys, was, you know. So I'm trying to figure out what it is. This is training mode. And it's really interesting what, what your mind and body does. So the first thing your mind and body does when you have nothing is you have fear. The first thing you feel is fear. And that we can all relate to in life. The first thing you feel when you all of a sudden feel that your plan and you have no, nothing organized and you have no structure and shelter and all of this stuff that we now rely on, you have fear. Now the fact that you're there on your own and you don't have a phone and you can't just call someone up and you don't know the city that you're in, your next thing is survival. Right. Fear leads to survival mode. So you're trying to find food from everywhere, you're trying to hoard it, you're trying to get it from everywhere, you're trying to keep it, you're trying to figure out wow. like, how can I get lots of this so that I can take care of myself? And you start just becoming crazy almost. And it's funny because those two experiences are so similar to what you see in society today. Yeah. Fear mm -hmm. breeds survival mode, which breeds greed and yeah. hoarding yeah. and wanting lack to have of abundance lack of abundance exactly and so you do that in that scenario for like remember this is a 30 day experiment oh. it's crazy so you do that for like the first week you do that for the first week where you just want to find anywhere steal look etc not steal trying not to steal but like finding fruits off trees whatever you're just trying to do whatever you can finding anywhere to sleep and, you, and you're fending for yourself it's all about you the interesting thing that, I, that happens in week two is that you recognize that you recognize that you really want to, when you make a difference in someone's life, they'll help you. So by week two, you start recognizing, oh, if I help villages, if I help this old lady, if I help this old man, if I serve the people around me, then they'll give it to me anyway. And we saw people inviting us into their homes, we saw people giving us food, we saw people cooking for us, just because we were helping people. Wow. And you start to see community, you start to see the value of collaboration, you start to see the value of energy exchange, you start to learn how your heart and soul leads to other people giving you their heart and soul. 
and, and you experience that. Now the interesting thing is that goes on for about two weeks and you think you've kind of mastered it. Right. And then the biggest challenge comes when this is what you're meant to grow to and this is where you go beyond feeling good about serving and getting an exchange. And this is not spoke about as prominent today because I think we live in a world where people aren't self-loved and self-fueled enough to even consider this. And so we talk a lot about self-love today, which I highly believe in. Right. We talk a lot about non-judgment of yourself today, which I highly believe in. But this principle is beautiful. We recognize by the final week that actually we were far stronger and capable than a lot of people on the planet, a lot of people in the village, sorry, that were disabled, that couldn't see, that had lost their eyesight, that couldn't speak, that couldn't walk, they had broken limbs. And so by the end of it, we realized that when we served others and gained, we could actually give to those people because they didn't have, because they weren't young men like we were. They weren't able men like we were. They weren't skilled like we were. And that so you can even go another level. You could go another level. It wasn't just that wow. you could take care of yourself, you could go another level. Wow. But those three stages of transformation show us exactly the three stages we need. The first is getting over your greed and ego. The second one is recognizing that you have value and when you serve others, there's a value exchange. And the third, when you're feeling full and overflowing, you can then overflow to others. And so for me, that 30 days like, has transformed my life ever since because I was able to experience all of the experiences we experience today, but in heightened mode. Like I didn't know where I was gonna sleep or where I was gonna eat. And, and when you experience it at that extreme and you're able to work it out, now in with, you have more perspective, you have more gratitude, you have more ability to navigate that emotion again. Yeah. And you recognize that it is an emotion. So for me, that was one of the most transformative things that I've ever done. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, and it just really took me on an internal journey of overcoming fear, overcoming greed, and always recognizing that you can always go that one step above. And recognizing that you don't, you know, as soon as you think you've figured it out, recognize that you haven't, and that there can be another level. And I think for all of us, that's a great reminder for me that when I think I have it figured out, that's the biggest reminder of there's still another level you've got to go. I think on a personal level, I valued deep thought because I loved rap music. So I used to listen to a lot of rap music growing up. And so people like Tupac, Eminem, Nas, etc. their lyrical abilities and their lyrical expression was a huge part of me growing up. And I used to spend a lot of time writing lyrics myself and playing with words. And I always enjoyed expressing things through poetry or spoken word. And when I read these books, a lot of them felt like poetry and spoken word. There were a lot of, uh, not just rhyme, but there was a lot of creative expression there. So I almost was very interested or intrigued because of the way the philosophy was being communicated. But I wouldn't say I was looking for it or seeking or any of that sort. I was just like, oh, this is impressive. This is interesting thought. Maybe I can apply it in my music or maybe I can use it here. Mm. It was less about the search for knowledge or wisdom. It was more about, oh, this could be cool to talk about here or this would be interesting to extract from. And when did it begin to change? When did your attitude towards theological texts or great uh, uh, spiritual works change from a kind of utilitarian curiosity that it could be magpied into a, hold on a minute there's something in here that's going to alter me so I think the big thing for me was the, the first time I met a monk and it's something that you can usually you can't ask someone like oh, when was the first time you met a monk ah but, my <laughs> first monk god I was just a slip of a girl then back in Kent picking apples on the coast they go well, so tell me what was your what was your first no, experience so, so I remember I was around 18 years old 17 18 years old and I found out from a friend that this monk had been invited to speak at a university and I was pretty uninterested to go I didn't wasn't really fascinated by it and I actually remember saying to my friend as long as we go out afterwards I'll turn up to the event so if we go to a bar as afterwards, usual dragged yeah. even <laughs> to, to the feet of a monk by lust yeah literally and so he said yeah I promise you and he was getting into spirituality and interested by these things so I went along 
And I was captivated. Who was it? So this man's name is Garanga Das. He lives in India. He's, I think you might have met him at the Eco Village. So he built the Eco Village. Uh, so you might have met him when you went there. In Mumbai. In the, Mumbai. The Krishna Consciousness Eco Village where it's like 100% carbon footprint free. They grow their own fruit, fruit and veg yeah. using, let's face it, human poo. <laughs> like, uh, like it's uh, there's animals there. They're growing Fragrant plants. flowers. It's and... sort of an amazing place. It's sort of beautiful, isn't it? You're it like, is. I suppose you're like me thinking, what systems could we replicate? in order to save the world absolutely and, and that seems like one so you met what's so it, I met him so again? Goranga, Goranga. So, so he came to he was speaking and just, just to put in context for everyone listening this man is Indian he has a strong Indian accent he's not necessarily externally attractive to the kind of person I'd be attracted to at that time I was attracted to Tupac yeah exactly and women right and rags to riches stories I loved celebrities and influencers mm. and people who'd made money like that's who I looked up to people who'd gone from nothing to something mm. and then I'm here listening to this man wearing robes and I'm totally captivated I'm just like wow he's so fascinating and the reason that he was fascinating is because he was talking about selfless service and he talked about how real meaning real happiness real fulfillment from life comes when you're able to plant trees under whose shade you do not plan to sit so you want to give shelter to others you want to provide things for others without expecting something back from them and at that time that idea just penetrated through my whole being why why when it's directly contradictory to your experience up to that point why is this message relevant so i think two things one thing is i was looking for a thrill in my teens and that's when i was getting involved in all sorts of wrong ideas wrong activities or wrong in the sense of things that we wouldn't recommend or want our children to what get you mean, involved drug, in sex fighting but, totally yeah all of that violence um petty theft all that kind of stuff and i wasn't doing it because i wanted stuff i was doing it because i wanted a thrill in life and when i saw him and saw the way he was living he had made that process thrilling like he looked happy he looked more happy more content more fulfilled than anyone i'd ever seen on top of that he was extremely charismatic and, and I just thought, I want to get to know this man. And then I found out that he'd given up jobs at some of the biggest companies in the world. And he went to IIT and had studied at IIT, which is the MIT of India, the Indian Institute of Technology. He was like a gold medalist at this place. And he'd given that all up to be a monk to serve humanity. And I thought, wow, that's, that's unbelievable because he's given up everything that everyone that I know is chasing, but he's happy and he's found meaning and he's found that fulfillment that I feel is just emanating from who he is. So it was the first time in my life where I'd gone from not looking up to someone who went from nothing to something, but someone who'd gone from something to nothing. And, and, I, and that was a massive paradigm shift moment for me and a, and a massive moment of just, wow, there is more out there. And, and I constantly say this, and I say it often, it's you can't be what you can't see. I would not have wanted to be a monk if I didn't see a monk who was fulfilled and happy and had, had this power about him. And up until that point, anyone that I'd seen that was rich or successful or beautiful or had a beautiful looking model, girlfriend or whatever it was, they still didn't emanate that happiness for me. Mm. So I'd saw that very early on, not in the extreme sense, I didn't have celebrity friends or anything, but from what I saw, I could very clearly see that material things weren't making people deeply happy. And he was someone who had given that up and seemed happy to me. There's a beautiful Indian story about a musk deer with a really powerful lesson. Now you may have already heard of musk, maybe because it exists in your perfumes or your aftershaves or deodorants as a scent. And this scent is one of the most expensive natural products in the world, fetching three times its weight in gold. Now when this deer comes across this aroma, this scent, it becomes completely captivated. It searches through the forest day and night for the source of this scent. Completely intoxicated by this incredible fragrance, the deer searches in every corner, in every place to find where it's coming from. The deer completely exhausts itself looking for the source. With the bitter irony, and not recognizing that the fragrance comes from inside its own body. The fragrance musk is produced in a gland in the deer's body. The deer spends its whole life searching for outside what was always hidden inside. 
I heard this example when I lived as a monk to describe the human condition of life. How we spend our whole lives looking for pleasures and happiness outside of us, when actually what we're searching for is right there inside of us. We try to find joy and happiness in external pleasures, in things, in results, when actually real happiness comes from meaning, relationships, and a connection with oneself. See, we all know that we can't love someone we don't know. So how can you love yourself when you don't know yourself? And just as this musk deer, we've probably had similar experiences. How many times have you walked out of your home and then felt that you've forgotten one of those top three things? Usually your keys, your wallet or purse, or your phone. You rush back in, you look around your own home, you make a mess, you make havoc, you look under every seat, every corner, and then realize that that phone, that wallet or purse, or those keys were in your back pocket. In the process of seeking happiness externally, we make a complete mess of our minds and life, and sometimes even the lives of others, not realizing that what we were truly looking for has always been with us. Today, we hear a lot about self-love and self-care, but neither of these are possible without self-knowledge, without self-realization, without self-awareness. Remember, if we don't know ourselves, we can't love ourselves. I remember, and this is like one of those moments, I remember being 10 years old in the school playground. The cutest girl at school had just found out that I fancied her, like every other guy at school liked her. And I remember a group of girls standing behind me in the playground, just taking the mick out of me and taking the fun out of me saying, oh, how can Jay think that he could be with her because he's so ugly and fat and all the rest of it. And, and, and I look back at that and I'm so happy it happened because I think it's, it's let me be more compassionate, let me be more empathetic, it's let me not be egotistical, it's, it's, it's humbled me and made me more grateful and realize how much hard work it is being any different, any way that we are. Mm. And so more accepting of reality. So I'm not upset about it at all. It's something that I think helped me. Our identity should start with unlearning everything that we think we know about ourselves. Okay, and how do we so, unlearn? So the best method of unlearning is this. First, and, and I'm gonna get really strategic and tactical because I think that people need to know what to do rather than a concept. The first thing you do is write down everything you currently are chasing in your life. Make a your long goals, list. Your dreams, your goals, your dreams, your dreams, accomplishments. Anything that you're currently chasing and pursuing. Okay. Write them down. You yeah. can write down three, you can write down five, you can write down 10 depending on how ambitious you are. Second line. Ask yourself, what is the source of that? Where did you get that idea? Did you get that idea from a TV show you saw? Did you get that idea from your parents? Did you get that idea from your mom and your dad, your sister, your cousin? Did you get that idea because your friend just got proposed to on Instagram? Mm. Did you get that idea because your friend just got promoted? Did you get that idea because you just broke up? Right. Or did you get that idea because you just feel it when you do it, that you feel alive? So Ask give me, yourself Give me a that. specific example that you had when you were 15, 18, was like a goal or accomplishment that you were chasing and where it came from. Absolutely, so my, my goal when I was young was to be an investment banker. Uh -huh. And when I really asked myself, where did that come from? It came because in my community, small community in London, the most successful person financially was an investment banker. Mm -hmm. So I believed you had to be an investment banker to be successful. Right. So when I asked myself that question, where does that come from? It comes from society's version of success, not mm -hmm. mine. And then the third thing you ask yourself yeah. is, well then what is mine? What is coming from inside of me? And if you just do that three step process, now what you're doing is you're filtering out the noise and you're starting to listen to your voice. The thing is you've got a voice inside of you, but yeah. it's quiet, it's like, it's like Jay, like <laughs> take note of me, like Lewis, right, like, right, you right. know, and it's just like trying to get through and the noise of everyone else's opinions is so loud. How so this way you filter it. We always have been trained to focus on the results. So people ask, what do you want in life? And I'm like, forget that. That's the worst question to ask someone. Because when you ask what you want, that's when the ads come in. And you're like, oh, I want that car. I want that home. I want that dress. I want that body. I want whatever it is. I, my question to you is, what do you want to wake up and be every day? Like, what do you want to wake up and do every day? What's the process that yeah. you're in love with? So we are thinking about the result, whereas my question is, forget the result. What's the process that you're in love with doing? So start there first of all. Don't start your journey of saying, I wanna be a movie director because 
I want to you know I want to hit the blockbuster chart so I want to do this don't make it about that like don't don't be like I want to be a singer because I want to be Ariana Grande right like that's not the point that's just a result do you love singing every day and I realized this with a very honest question to myself I'm really passionate about football soccer I absolutely love the game I grew up on it I'm still a huge fan I missed out on it when I was a monk I've been catching up ever since <laughs> like I'm like oh I, any football game I was just in London last week and I made sure I went I didn't, couldn't see a game live but I went and watched it at a, at a bar in London and I love the energy I'm so passionate about soccer I don't have what it takes to be a soccer player yeah like I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate when I was a monk, I wake up at six, uh, 5.30 a.m. now to meditate. I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. to go out on a raining pitch and play soccer. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be in the gym for four hours a day. I want to meditate for four hours a day, but I don't want to uh, play soccer for four hours a day and then be in the gym and train. I'm not envious of any athlete in the world because it takes a different type of mindset. I really believe that everything we say I, a beautiful thought from Gandhi where he said that when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in line, then you'll experience harmony. And, and I've really taken that to heart. And it's, it's this powerful spiritual principle, and it really means a lot think, to me. What you think, what you say, and what you do are aligned. Mm. And so for me, any form of language, any form of your emotional vocabulary is building your mental reality. And I think people forget that their vocabulary is defining their life. You are creating your life on a daily basis by the words you use. So for me, and, and I'm not saying that I feel that way about everyone else, I'm saying that's how I feel about that word. Someone may say, oh, when I say a swear word, it, it makes me laugh. For me, it doesn't. That I would only swear when I felt bad and I felt something negative towards something so for me that had negative emotions negative connotations and negative uh, intention attached to it so I wanted to remove anything from my vocabulary that I felt was negative so even as simple as and I've done this very recently but it's changed my life instead of me saying I'm busy or it's been a busy week I say I'm having a productive week and I feel different when I go to bed just by that simple change I go to bed thinking yeah I've had a really productive day today rather than going god I had a busy day today like mm. I don't want to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to have a busy day tomorrow. And so that simple emotional vocabulary change has just catapulted my mind into feeling excited and enthusiastic all the time. I was really shy. I didn't enjoy stages. I didn't enjoy speaking. My parents forced me to go to public speaking and drama school. So I spent 14 to 18 in public speaking and drama school. Changed my life. I did not know what I wanted to speak about. So even when I finished at 18, I still didn't like going on stage because I didn't have anything to talk about. So now you've got the tools but you haven't got the passion. So I developed somewhat of an expertise in four years, but I didn't have what I was passionate about. And then when I became a monk, I was like, this is it. This is why I went to public speaking school, because I love talking about philosophy, I love talking about science, I love talking about culture, I love talking about life, I love talking about growth, et cetera, the mind. So I got what I was passionate about when I became a monk. So for me, the process came from four years of consistent public speaking school. Like, it changed my life. And, and that's all thanks to my parents for forcing me to go. I had no interest in being a public speaker or a storyteller or any of these things. That was just, I lucked out. And then it was me finding what I was passionate to speak about. And then I've spoken, I've spoken for three hours a day for the last 13 years. And I spoke to audiences of zero all the way to audiences now of thousands. But when I first started speaking, I remember I was invited to speak at a university where I wasn't getting paid for it. I was like 20 years old. I was invited to speak to this university. No one showed up, twice. So they organized two events for me. I was meant to speak about life, philosophy, etc., all the kind of stuff I speak about now, and zero people turned up. And I practiced my speech both times to an empty room <clears throat> as if it was a packed room. Because I was like, I'm still gonna practice. And so for me, having done this for three hours a day for the last 13 years, that's now being gratefully received online. So I'm very fortunate that it's shifted from an offline world to an online world, which we can dive into. Yeah. But the point is, it's, it's been my absorption and addiction for, like, for, for over a decade now. One of the biggest mistakes we make is that we confuse inexperience with being unqualified. So because we've not tried a lot of things, we just naturally believe that we can't be that good at them. Mm -hmm. So if I've never spoken on a stage, I just think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. Or if I've never played golf, I'd probably think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. And so we start writing off things without even trying them. So the best method I can share with someone is, take the next month, 
take the next four weekends in the month that gives you eight days and get really tactical every single day that's why you're playing tennis a lot right now yeah play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> take the eight days go join a course an online course a workshop go and shadow a friend go to a seminar a conference go to reading a book listen yeah. to a podcast go and expose yourself to eight different things in a month eight different things eight different things mm-hmm. in a month and guess what in a month you will have learned what you probably would have learned in eight years because most of us test one new thing a year maybe maybe if that exactly right like some people don't even do that but if you do eight different things in a month and this is how you have to see it if you went to eight different restaurants in a month you ask yourself after you eat a meal, like I had that burrito or I had that taco, did I like it? Right, the first question you ask yourself is you, did I like it? You gotta like try it first. You gotta try it first, you gotta go to the restaurant. Yeah. There's no point, so you gotta say did I like it? The second question you ask yourself is why did I or why did I not like it? Mm-hmm. Like why is so important? I think too many people just yeah. go, I like it or I don't like it, why did I like it? And the third question you have to ask yourself really, really simple is do I wanna do it again? Mm. And if you do, that's where you start uncovering. So my point is, inexperience. Do not misinterpret inexperience for a lack of qualification. In the hope for money, in the hope for success, we end up chasing the wrong things and we make a mess. We end up with less than we started with, end up with more issues than we bargained for. Whilst climbing that ladder and that stairway, we forget why we started climbing in the first place. Once, the king of Bhutan was asked by an interviewer what the GDP of Bhutan was. He was surprised and shocked. He replied by saying, in Bhutan, we don't just measure the GDP, we measure the GNH. Instead of just measuring the gross domestic product, we measure gross national happiness. In the process of getting older, we forget the real goal of life. If you could make a little less and spend more time doing what you love, would that make you happier? Don't trade your happiness for what you think you need. Things can never make us happy because they're temporary and limited, but experiences can last forever. Too many people are working hard on things they don't love, to spend money they don't have, to buy things they don't need, to impress people they don't like. When we create our identity around what we do, a career, a job, an occupation, we can never be happy because we're basing it on something external. But when we create an identity around who we are and what we want to be and become, then anything is possible. And remember, We become successful by what we get, but we become happy by what we give. Don't get the two confused. I start off the chapter with this beautiful thought from Charles Horton Cooley, and I love telling it because it's just, it's just the best. And I think it was written in like the 1900s. And he said, today the challenge is, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I I am. am. It's crazy, man. And it's like, it blows my mind every time I say it. It gives me the chills, like I feel it. And the reason why I start with identity is because I think that's the root of all our challenges. And the first step to thinking like a monk is starting at the root, not starting at the symptoms or the superficial or the surface level. But let's go to the root. If you're playing a role, if you're wearing a mask, Mm -hmm. if you're dressed in clothes that are not yours, then you end up living a life that's not yours. Mm. And in the book, I give this example of method acting. Yes, with so, Daniel Day-Lewis, Yeah, I'm, I'm a massive movie junkie, and I love method actors. So people like Heath Ledger, of course, from the yes. Dark Knight series. You've got Jared Leto. So Jared Leto, when he played the Joker in, this is not in the book, in Suicide Squad, uh-huh. he used to send dead rats in the mail to his co-stars. He did not. He did, because he was trying to get into the mindset of how someone that perverted would behave. And then Daniel Day-Lewis, when he was filming for Gangs of New York, he's actually wearing these coats that are centuries old so that he can get into character when he's off camera. Yeah, when he can feel it, right? He's not wearing watches. He's not carrying around his mobile phone. They're speaking in the accents. And he talks about how he actually went crazy. Because guess what? When you fake being someone for so long, you think it's your reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to all of us. We play a role at work, we play a role at home, we play a role with our family, we play a role with our friends, and then we think that role is us. And we lose ourselves. And to me, that is the core reason why we're chasing things that are not important to us. The envy actually is more of a, 
expression of how we feel about ourselves rather than how we're perceiving someone else. It's actually so much more about how comfortable we feel with who we are, how confident who we feel with who we are, how much self-esteem we have, how much self-assurance we have. Envy is more a root of that than it is of the fact that someone else is doing well. It's less about the fact that someone out there is amazing, making waves, doing something that you want to be doing. It's more about how we feel about ourselves and it's experienced in that way of looking at someone else and reflecting back on us. Social circles, family circles, someone else has done amazingly in the exams, someone just landed a new job, someone else just got promoted and everyone's looking at you going, what are you doing? Right, what have you achieved? Where, where are you today? Where have you got? Right, what's happening with you? Tell us about you. And you're thinking, you know, you're going through all your head, you're trying to come up with all the things that you've thought about, all the things that you've achieved, all the things that you've done, and you're trying to bring it up, like constantly. But you're struggling, you find it hard because you're now measuring your growth based on someone else's. You're now measuring your success based on someone else's. And that is the biggest challenge with envy. The one of the biggest challenges it brings in our life is that it forces us to start measuring our sex, uh, sorry, our success in comparison to someone else's. That is the biggest challenge with envy. When we start comparing the level of our success with someone else's, you're already on the wrong foot. I think any sorts of dress or any sort of whether it be yeah dress or appearance or any of that if it's taking you away from who you actually are and how you like expressing yourself then then that kind of contradicts being able to be authentic and mm -hmm. being real so like, i feel more authentic wearing this than i did wearing my robes when i was a monk literally use your weekends and evenings to do a test on anything the best way is go and do a course test it out Try doing it once. Go and shadow someone who does it. Someone in your life that does it. If you want to be a podcaster, come and shadow you guys for a week, right? And see what that life's like. See what it actually looks like to research, to sit with a guest, to find new guests, to work it out. Like, go and shadow someone who's already doing it. And then try and do it for a day. Like, try and do the schedule of someone you look up to for a day. Like, if you can do that for a day and you loved it, then do it for one more day. And if you loved it, do it for another day and that's gonna trickle in. So that's a much smarter way to finding your passion rather than just sitting there and reflecting, which is cool, which is important, but I'd encourage you to just get out there, right? Get out there and live the life of someone who's doing it when they started. That's another point. Don't focus on what people are doing now. Focus on what they were doing when they started. So a lot of people ask me, they're like, Jay, how many videos do you make a week? I'm like, I make three videos a week, plus my podcast on top of that, plus Instagram. And they'll say, oh, wow, that's too much. And I was like, yeah, but when I started, I made right. one video a week, <laughs> right? Like, you don't have to start at what I'm doing now. Like, you, you <clears throat> start. So, that you know, go back to that. How boring would it be to live in a world where everyone was just like us? Imagine if everyone in your life talked like you, thought like you, walked like you. The world would be a boring place. There'd be no new cultures to explore, no new languages to learn, no new adventures to be had. If you want 10 more amazing rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. And often when we ask questions, Brendan, to the world at least, or to the universe, they're often demands, they're not questions. They're like, why is this happening to me? You know, that's not a question. That is a, that is pain.